Welcome to another episode of the MMA Lockcast. I'm your host, Manpreet, aka MMA Lock of the Night, your boy on social media at MMA LOTN, and the architect behind the MMA Fight Archive, where we've just recently surpassed 3,300 fighter profiles. Yes, 3,300 fighter profiles for you guys to utilize for your upcoming research for not just the UFC, but this weekend alone, we also have ACA, LFA, A1 Combat, and Cage Warriors, not to mention a total of 17 different promotions that we cover on this uh, platform, ensuring you leave no stone unturned when you're researching these upcoming fights, not only utilized by handicappers and gamblers and, and predictors, but also commentators for some of these promotions, fighters and coaches to ensure they leave, like I said, no stone unturned what they're researching. There's a seven day free trial for you to check it out for free. Link for that is in the description below. Once again, that is the MMA Fight Archive. Check that thing out. All right. This week we are going over UFC Vegas or sorry, UFC Atlantic City. I'm so used to us being at the apex that it's a surprise that the UFC will be in front of a live crowd this evening or this weekend uh, as they head over to New Jersey to Atlantic City and they have a flyweight main event in the women's division between Aaron Blanchfield and Manol Fiorot. Uh, Blanchfield obviously from that neck of the woods, so there should be some solid support for her there. But it's very important because this fight could possibly determine who gets the upcoming shot at the flyweight title. Now, obviously, See the flyweight title is in a little bit of limbo as we've had Alexa Grasso and Valentina Shevchenko have back-to-back fights against each other, the last of which went to a draw, and now they are scheduled to be the coaches for the upcoming season of the Ultimate Fighter, and then usually that means that they will end up fighting after that, and that should probably happen around September, if I'm not mistaken which means that the winner of this matchup, if they really do want a title fight next, they'll probably have to sit on the sidelines until at least next year, early next year. I'd be surprised if they get back in the cage late this year, depending on what the champion wants. Um, But still, very high stakes in this main event slot for UFC Atlantic City. Uh, Co-main event has a bomb welterweight matchup between Vicente Luque and Joaquin Buckley, a fight that will more than likely produce a lot of fireworks and a lot of entertainment, possible fight of the night as well so there are some fun fights to be um, excited about on this 14 fight card that the UFC has coming up for us as we always do let's take a quick look at this past weekend's results for your boy in terms of the regional events uh, we end up pretty much in the black there Uh, we go two and two on lock of the night plays over the four events we go one and three in terms of the dog of the night plays and i'll tell you the percentages very shortly um but very happy with the dog of the night performances would have been nice to get at least one more lock of the night to hit for us to at least go three and one but we uh we nailed the ufc event which is the main focus considering the bulk of the interactions and views that are coming to the channel and subscribers most of those people focus only on the ufc but we want to be good everywhere but I'm happy with the performance for the UFC. So let's quickly touch on that here. The lock of the night for the UFC comes through as Mick Parkin cashes as a minus 140 favorite uh, over Mohamed Usman. A very close fight. You know, I thought, uh, I think it was, I could have it wrong here, but I think it was round one that was probably Usman's. Round two was probably Parkin's. And then round three, I thought Parkin did enough to edge that round out. Um, yes, it was round one for Usman now that I'm remembering. Parkin, I thought, did a lot more effective damage in round two. And then in round three, I thought, Parkin did a lot of good work as well obviously the big movement being when he really buckled the legs of Usman when he landed that calf kick I expected Parkin to be a little bit more active in terms of his output I thought maybe he would try to engage in the wrestling a little bit just to really start to wear on that gas tank of Usman but he was content with you know evading the big shots that Usman was telegraphing a lot and then countering effectively and landing that lead calf kick as well so good work for Parkin there a lot of hate on him for the week Uh, a lot of people thinking there were value on Usman Again, it was a close fight, so you can make your own conclusions in regards to that. But I really expected Parkin to be the better fighter that night. The crisper striker, maybe a little bit more volume would have been nice. But I still was very confident into that, going into that fight and happy with the result there. So the lock of the night cash is there. Like I said, over the four events over the weekend, we went two and two on the lock of the night plays. Uh, the One of them that lost out, I remember from the top of my head, was the Michael Oliveira under one and a half for LFA. Uh, his opponent was very game, way more game than I expected somebody who was coming off an extended layoff. Ultimately, it was only 10 seconds left in the fight where Oliveira ended up getting the finish. So very unfortunate that we were unable to cash the under one and a half there. And the second lock of the night is actually a 
escaping me. We had um, Alexander Popik on Octagon, who was able to cash for us pretty easily there. Uh, let me just quickly pull it up here. It's it's boggling my mind, the other lock of the night that I missed out on. So I want to make sure I get it right here for you guys. Um, oh, yeah, uh, Bellator. I was very confident in Isaiah Pinson going into that matchup uh, against Abraham Babley, but uh, he couldn't get anything done. You know, I, I expected more activity from Pinson in terms of getting back to his feet when he got taken down, uh, having a higher output in the second and third rounds, but he seemed completely muzzled by the wrestling of Babley, which I knew was going to be a factor going into this matchup, but I really expected Pinson to stop those takedowns and be more effective in the second and third rounds. That did not happen at all. So we had to rip up a plus one 55 lock of the night ticket there i was very confident in him going into that matchup and we end up getting burned from it so that now brings our lock of the night, a lock of the night record for 2024 to 18 and 12 for a 60 percent hit rate uh, a percentage down from the weekend prior but really need to work on that and get that back into the positive black first then the green but we'll get there when we get there the dog of the night was Luis Pajuelo a little bit too confident in his ability to eat damage from prior fights that he's had and I thought he'd be able to really walk down Padilla here land his own damage and potentially find a finish in the second or third rounds as Padilla starts to slow down but Padilla was on a man on a mission he did not like the Kyle Nelson results and he made sure he didn't fall victim to that once again he really sniped Pajuelo there and uh put Padrillo out pretty much so good work from Padilla to to win that fight um again uh dog of the nights this past week and go one and three um or sorry three and one meaning that all three of the dog of the nights that I had for the regional scene ended up coming through for us uh Felipe Oliveira I believe was the one for LFA uh for Bellator I believe it was um again I should probably have this ready I usually only have my UFC stuff ready but I want to quickly uh, ensure I get this correct as well. So yeah, uh, LFA was uh, Felipe Oliveira, plus 145 cash against Kyle Machado. Um, Erijan Topalaj on Octagon 55 comes through at plus 100. And then the dog of the night um, for Bellator, easy one here, Patricio Pitbull cashes at plus 105. Uh, it seemed like the momentum was going in uh, Kennedy's favor, but we know... Patricio is always dangerous, and he was able to go out there and get the victory there. All right, let's quickly talk about the rest of the um, dog, of, or sorry, uh, rest of the plays that we had for the UFC here, going from top to bottom on the graphic. Main event, we had Rosenam Yunus minus 180 to win one unit there. Um, you know, a veteran performance. She went out there, landed the takedowns, got some good control time, and then eventually won on the scorecards. Uh, she closed closer to minus 210, 220. I saw her get up to minus 260 at a certain point of the week last week, but I was very happy to uh, lock her in nice and early at minus 180, so happy to hit that. Uh, Peyton Talbot has a breakthrough performance there, uh, cashing 1.5 units for us at minus 135 against Cameron Simon. He ends up being like the biggest star coming off this weekend. You know, I see him all over the timeline now. Very fun fighter, very smooth with his striking, and he showcased it by finishing the very tough Cameron Simon. Uh, already touched on Pajuelo. Uh, Trey Ogden, another guy that I was considering as a potential lock that I play, was getting absolutely shit on during the entire fight week as a lot of people just kept looking back at his Jordan Levitt loss, but he went out there with the perfect game plan against Kurt Holabaugh and shut him down. I knew takedowns were going to be the crux of his game plan in that matchup as Holabaugh has given up a ton of control time in the past, but luckily for him, he's been fighting opponents that he's been able to submit or... Um, Guys that eventually slowed down and he was able to take advantage of. But Ogden, great gas tank, great BJJ black belt, and great wrestling. And he showcased it that night. We were able to cash two units on him there. Um, last minute, I took a one-unit shot on Montserrat Rendon at plus 220. Close-ish fight. Um, you know, Rendon did a little bit better than I expected it to, especially at plus 220. But we don't end up getting the ticket there. But again, you know low-ish level women's MMA to get a plus 220 and still have the fight come that close. I'm happy to take that shot there. Uh, Igor De Silva, aka Igor Severino, one year and a plus 155. Uh, I thought the momentum was starting to swing in his favor after two judges scored uh, the first round for Andre Lima. In the second round, Severino was trying to get his grappling going, and that is when the bite 
heard around the world was uh, um, had been taken, and uh, Severino ends up losing that fight by disqualification, and then ultimately ends up getting cut by the UFC. Very unfortunate for a very young talent here. I believe he's 20, 21 years old, super talented, 8-0 and coming into this fight. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be tough for him to have some sort of redemption arc in terms of going back to the regional scene, building his way back up, and hopefully the UFC will be like, all right, you know what? You paid your dues. Let's bring you back in. Or he ends up going to Bellator or PFL or something like that. But very unfortunate result there for Igor uh, Severino. Uh, And I really wanted to see that fight play out over 15 minutes as I still have some big question marks about Andre Lima. But uh, we have to rip up a ticket there. And then the the last one there, which I didn't talk about, at a .2 unit shot on parking by submission in round three at plus 3,000. Was really hoping that would come through for us, but uh, no grappling whatsoever from parking to take advantage of that or even try to get that propped hit for us so we have to rip up that ticket but all in all for the ufc plus four five plus four point five four units for a 30 percent roi happy that we're solidly in the green there pretty much in the black overall for the weekend we had two winning events two losing events but pretty much in the black there um really need to round it out to get that progress back into the the right way so um uh, on the year still positive uh but i still would like to have it higher than where it's currently at um yeah There you guys go. Recap for UFC Vegas 89. Reminder, Locky two-step, which hit this past weekend, that now increases our record to the year uh, to seven and three. Uh, I dropped that on the Lock of the Night Patreon page every Monday evening. So if you want early access to that, check that out. Otherwise, you can wait until Thursday when I drop it to the public for free, although the line may have moved by that time. So take advantage of uh, getting it on the Patreon page. Uh, The Locky Trinity fell short, drops to four and and six on the year, but still solid profit considering it's usually plus 200 to plus 300 given uh, that it's usually a three-leg parlay. Uh, lastly, shout out to Godzilla Wins, providing your boy a platform to drop written content to the public for free. Thursdays, we drop the main event uh, breakdown, and then Fridays, we drop the three best money line spots. Make sure you guys go out there and check that bad boy out as well. All right, we got 14 fights to break down on this UFC Atlantic City card So I want to save my voice as much as possible and get right into it. A little bit of a longer intro, but I I like going over these recaps. Uh, You know, one, to be transparent, two, to kind of just talk about uh, where I may have gone wrong on some of those spots. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate you guys sticking by or sticking through those recaps if you guys end up doing so. Um, Also, if you're on YouTube or even watching it on the podcast, I have the timestamps. So if you want to skip the recaps and get right to the breakdowns, you guys can do that as well. the the the, you know the positives of technology and where we're at all right let's get right on to pace here first fight of the night bantamweight division angel pacheco going up against kowlin lorraine uh we got plus 285 on pacheco and uh minus 350 on the irishman lorraine i believe it's irish uh pacheco obviously earned his uh way to the ufc through the Dana White Contender Series, but that was off of a loss. You know, one of the very few fighters that have been signed, even after losing on that platform, but the UFC was impressed with his ability to fight back from adversity against Danny Silva. Uh, he didn't win any of the rounds on the scorecards, but he stayed in that fight even after getting hurt multiple times and showcasing that he had very good durability, a very good chin, and a great heart, something that he can rely on to go out there and stay in fights. He's a BJJ brown belt, training out of the New England cartel, and on the region regional scene not that bad right but he was fighting some abysmal competition outside of Wilson Nangdragoni absolutely nailed it there uh former CFFC bantamweight champion if I'm not mistaken he was able to you know come back after getting rocked in the first round come back in the second round land a beautiful flying knee and then eventually get a rear naked choke to defeat him uh then took some time off and then came into the contender series and got absolutely butchered by Danny Silva normally Pacheco utilizes a lot of forward movement likes to stay in his opponent's face uh straight shots down the pipe good kicks up the middle but I think he I don't know if he has what it takes to really get to the next level um or at least be successful at this level especially against the level of competition he's going to be going up against especially considering the guy that he's facing this weekend Callan Lorraine had his UFC debut last time around at uh, UFC Paris came up short against a very skilled and experienced veteran in Taylor Lapalus 
It was a fight that was 1-1 going into the final frame, where in the second round, Colin had major success with his grappling, keeping Lapalus on the mat, landing some damage, and getting some dominant control time. But he was unable to secure that same position in the third round, allowing Lapalus to land the better shots and eventually win that fight on the scorecards. Normally, La Reina is a guy that utilizes his forward pressure and relentless grappling to break his opponents and eventually finish them in the second or third rounds. He's only had one win by decision, uh, which goes to show how aggressive he normally is in terms of seeking the finish and getting his opponents out of there. He's been training at Team Calbon, which was previously famous for guys like Darren Till uh, and Mike Grundy. And Grundy is the key ingredient here for Lorraine, who has been able to, to really uh, get that wrestling rub from Grundy so that he can be successful in his own ability to grind opponents against the cage, drag them to the ground, and then just put them through absolute hell. Pacheco could land some straight shots down the pipe in this matchup that could hurt Lorraine, but I expect the Irishman to go out there, grind him out, drag him to the mat, and really overpower him, outmuscle him. Uh, Pacheco has had some issues in the past in terms of working off the cage and working out of bad positions and I think a guy as strong as Lorraine will keep that pressure on him I don't know if you'll be able to finish him I'd rather just maybe parlay his money line in this spot but I do think that we'll see Lorraine pretty much control where this fight takes place uh, dictate the pace of it as well and end up getting his hand raised on the scorecards all right, moving over to the middleweight division, we got Andre Petrosky coming in at plus 180. He goes up against Jacob Malkoon, who comes in at minus 210. Now, last time around, we saw Petrosky have his five-fight winning streak snapped by getting knocked out in just over a minute against Michel Pereira. That was a fight that he took on short notice, which I'm, which I'm sure he's hoping he could get back, but he's really feeling himself in a very so solid groove. Like I said, five fight winning streak, going out there, finishing, finishing some guys, also going to decision and getting his hand raised. Um, but he's a strong wrestler, a guy that's very difficult to deal with when he's able to establish that top position. He's starting to trust his hands a little bit more so he doesn't have to be so relentless with his grappling, which ultimately starts to slow him down later on in the matchups. But he's a guy similar to Miles Johns from this past weekend who, you know, uh, their body language indicates that they are absolutely gas late in matchups, but they stay busy enough and safe enough late in fights that they still manage to see the scorecards. Obviously, we saw Pereira start him in the first round, but the other fight where we saw him really start to slow down, or two fights where we've seen him slow down in deeper waters, was on the Ultimate Fighter, where he came up short against eventual winner Brian Battle, and also Aaron Jeffrey, who was able to defeat him in the CFFC range. Um, he's still very talented. He just kind of managed the gas tank a little bit better or continue to hone that craft um power puncher uh strong wrestling good chokes but he's up against a guy in jacob malkoon who is all go you know all gas no breaks this guy loves to grapple loves to take his opponents down and doesn't even show any takedown defense considering he's faced three takedown attempts and has uh pretty much uh given them all up also that he can eventually reverse the position um you know he works relentlessly no matter what position he's in to always try to get to a more dominant position one thing i would like to see improve from him is his ability to dish out a little bit more damage while uh, controlling his opponents that probably would have been the difference maker in him getting that win over brendan allen in a very close first round uh, which the judges ended up scoring in allen's favor because he was the one landing more damaging shots but malkuna had some good control time in that first round he just wasn't letting go with his shots enough to end up getting the win there now last time around was very unfortunate for him he was absolutely starting to maul Cody Brundage until he landed some big de uh, uh, shots to the back of the head uh, that apparently the referee had previously warned him about and then they eventually ended up disqualifying him and uh, handing him uh, another loss in his professional career but this is a guy who's only seven and three but still very talented in this aspect of being able to push a high pace that normally breaks most opponents uh, his takedown attempts could use a little bit of work but it's his relentlessness and his ability to chain attempts to get that makes him so successful and so dominant a lot of people are knocking him for having a horrible chin after his ufc debut only lasted 18 seconds where he got knocked out by phil haas but he managed to come back against big hitters and still go out there and utilize his game and be successful with it i'm a big malcoon fan i love his pace his pressure and his ability to just stay working stay moving and i think that's going to be the ultimate downfall here for petrosky i think petrosky needs to get an early finish in the spot for him to have any success he might be able to latch on to a choke hopefully malkoon sticks with that never settled style and continues to move to get out of those bad positions or if petrosky is able to land a big shot on the feet which is possible 
but I think it's going to be just a awkwardness the movement the continuous uh staying in motion from Alcun that's going to allow him to land takedowns um continue to grind on Petrovsky keep up a high pace that will cause Petrovsky to slow down and then from there we should should see Malkun really start to put the grind on him possible third round finish but I do think we'll see uh, Malkun uh win this fight on the scorecards pretty dominantly especially in the second and third rounds he just needs to be a little bit aware of the the finishing capabilities of Petrovsky which are very real especially in the first round and a half of this matchup. So give me Malkoon and Malkoon by decision. All right, moving on to the next matchup, which is a women's flyweight bout. We got Victoria Dudikova coming in at plus 125. She takes on Melissa Gatto, who's at minus 145. Um, I'm very intrigued by this matchup because a lot of people are high on Dudikova, especially in her contender series fights. Um, uh, or her sorry her contender series fight where she came in with a bad knee injury um but still managed to go out there and grind out a very tough maria silva she then followed that up with an unfortunate tko injury against estela nunez and then after that ended up uh defeating Jin Yu fry in a fight that was much closer than the minus 600 indicated that dudakova was now normally we see dudakova utilize a very grapple heavy approach she was unable to do so against Jin Yu fry as she went 0-3 on takedown attempts but still managed to stay consistent enough with her striking that she was able to win the first and third round the second round is the big question mark here as she got taken down relatively easily by Jinyu Fry maybe because Dudakova wasn't really expecting that from Fry uh, but it was her inability to work back to her feet she gave up pretty much four minutes of control time that round because she was kind of passive like she wasn't throwing up many submissions she eventually um threw up an arm bar near the ending of that round which eventually caused a stand-up after that um but like she wasn't showing much off of her back which is a big red flag now she's still only 25 years old she could be improving she spent half of this camp i believe in russia and the latter half over there at the mma masters in florida um undefeated still so like whatever she's doing is working but as she continues to take steps up in competition it's going to get harder for her to be successful with that her opponent this week Melissa Gatto is riding a two-fight losing streak very surprising for a fighter that looks so dominant through her first couple fights with the UFC um I was very confident in her in her last matchup against Ariane Lipsky, uh, but I was very surprised to see her be the one that was on the back foot in the beginning of the fight. Gato is normally a, you know, a very aggressive fighter, throws a lot of punches, likes to mix in takedowns, very aggressive even off of her back when she gets taken to the mat, uh, likes to use elbows and knees, uh, really tries to break her opponents with her pressure. Um, you know, I'd say a little bit more calculated pressure than a guy like Malkun, who I just spoke about recently uh, or previously. Um, but, uh, you know, it was a fight where uh, Gato was actually a minus 320 favorite going into the third round, meaning that a lot of judges pro or a lot of people were expecting that Gato had secured the first two rounds and went to a split decision, and she ended up losing that fight. But I think uh, even myself, who was very heavy on her that night, going to the scorecards, I had a lot of reservations thinking, okay, this could actually end up being a Lipsky fight because she seemed to be the one landing more uh, significant damage especially in the striking round which ended up being the difference maker there but she's very aggressive uh, going into researching this matchup I expected to be on the Dudakova side especially with her being an underdog in the spot however I think the aggressive style of Gato will cause Dudakova some issues here even if Dudakova decides to go out there and grapple in this fight like she normally does I think she might struggle with the aggressive guard that Gato normally showcases you know throwing elbows off her back throwing up submissions looking for reversals that's not going to allow Dudakova to really be comfortable from that top position and it might even be one of those spots where we see Gato winning this fight off of her back um also on the flip side if Gato looks to go out there and utilize her wrestling and try to take this to the ground we don't really have much um confidence coming off of Dudakova's last fight to believe that she should be able to nullify any of the top control that Gato is going to be uh, throwing at her so I think Gato more aggressive Gato should look better optically speaking as long as she doesn't accept the back foot like she did against Lipsky but I think she's going to trust her own striking over due to COVID striking here which doesn't look horrible but doesn't provide as much threats as Lipsky striking in my opinion I still have some question marks regarding the minus 145 line like I don't know if it's me just overreacting to losing money on Gato last time around but I think that she should win this matchup I might be honing in on her submission prop which I believe last time I saw was around plus 400 rather than taking the chalk um but i think she wins this matchup uh and i think she ends up getting the submission as well 
All right, moving on to the next matchup. It's a light heavyweight bout, and it's actually a rematch of a fight that took place on the regional scene. I'm talking about Ibo Aslan going up against, uh, who's minus 125, going up against Anton Turkali, who's coming in at plus 105. Now, Aslan got his contract on the U- through the contender series to the UFC with half a round and was all it took for him to knock out Paulo Hanato Jr. in a fight where he was being very disciplined, very patient. And then when the opportunity opened itself to hurt Hanato, he was able to do so, follow up with some big punches and get him out of there. This is a fighter that has spent time in Thailand for this training camp, but also spent the last couple of weeks over there at Extreme Couture where he's been rounding out the rest of his skill set. Um, he's a guy that's been very close with Roman Delizia in the past, if I'm not mistaken. And I think that we'll see um, you know, an even more patient and composed version of Aslan coming into this matchup. Uh, his lone defeat came to his opponent this weekend, Anton Dracali, who survived six minutes of getting his ass kicked by Ibo Aslan before Aslan gassed out. Dracali was able to get his back and sink in a rear naked choke, I believe it was, that ended up causing the tap from Aslan. But I believe a lot of it was from Aslan just slowing down, thinking that he had Dracali out of there. But you know, and there is a realm where the referee could have stopped that fight in the first round against Tricali, and Aslan is still undefeated at this point in time. That's something that you have to wonder about. Um, but I understand the close line here, right? Tricali has more paths to victory in the aspect that, like, if he stays safe enough in the striking room early or at least tries to engage in the clinch and get his takedowns going, he could really wear on the gas tank of Aslan and possibly find his own finish later on in this matchup. Um, but he really has his back against the wall here. Three fight losing streak, been finished in two of those, most recently against Tyson Pedro where he got knocked out. Very bad look in my opinion to get knocked out by a guy like Tyson Pedro. Uh, it really makes you question the durability of Anton Tricali who continuously gets hurt in pretty much all of his fights. It's insane. But when he is in his groove it's relentless wrestling relentless grappling uh smothering his opponents and trying to look for the finish by submission tko whatever it might be in this matchup though i think we're gonna see a maturity in aslan you know he fought to call i believe about four years ago five years ago at this point in time um i believe it was four or three and a half years ago uh was that fight and that's where he ended up coming up short uh and i think we'll see him have learned from that matchup and uh, i think we saw some of those uh, improvements in the hanato fight where he was disciplined he was measured he didn't just go all balls out right away he waited for that shot to open up it open up and he was able to take advantage of it hurt his opponent once he saw his opponent was hurt then he went in for the kill and eventually got it i think he'll be able to do that here against Takali as well but at minus 125 which is the same line as the under one and a half i would rather take the under one and a half in case there is some fuckery in case of Takali landing a takedown and then from there i think he is the far superior grappler here which could produce a finish for him as well within a round and a half so minus 125 the under one and a half is probably what i like in this matchup the most but i think it's ultimately going to be Aslan who ends up finding that knockout probably in the third or fourth minute of this first round so give me Aslan and Aslan by first round knockout next up featherweights we got Dennis Bazookia going up against Connor Matthews Bazookia obviously 0-2 in the UFC now after getting a short notice call up against Sean Woodson in a fight where he realized there are absolute levels to this shit where he got swept on the scorecards and got teed off teed off on over 15 minutes by the long lanky striking style of Sean Woodson uh then last time around he got starched in less than a minute by Jamal Emmers uh that was a fight where he was fighting kind of in his hometown in front of his home crowd uh and it was not a good look for him whatsoever Bazookia is a guy that was highly touted from the regional scene for a long time. I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that he was teamed up with the Sarah Longo guys and those guys continuously pushed him. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't think he'll get that far in the UFC. Like, even if he loses this matchup, he might end up being on the chopping block here. Uh, but he has some decent skills and obviously enough to be successful on the regional scene. Um, good combination striking, uh, likes to stay busy with uh, his kicks and punches, uh, has started to develop a wrestling game as well to try to make fights look more f- so in his favor optically if they were to hit the scorecards as well. But not a guy that I really think is going to be able to make it, you know, close to the top 20 of this division. His opponent this weekend, Connor Matthews, earned his spot through uh, the contender series this past season after coming up short in 2022 to Francis Marshall, uh, went to looking for a fight, picked up a big early win there by submission in the first round, and then got the call back to the contender series, and then beat his opponent uh, by decision. But I still see some holes in his game. This guy is a very physical fighter, likes his one-twos down the pipe, 
tries to knock his opponents out more than actually trying to set other things up. Uh, has a nasty choke game as well, especially when he's able to get his opponents to the mat. But I think if his opponents are able to stuff those takedowns and implement their own style, that's where Matthews really starts to struggle. I think he has a bit of a... I don't want to say a horrible gas tank issue, but I think that we see a clear slowdown in his game later on in his fights, um, especially if he's fighting a more talented fighter. And I think Bazookia is probably more talented all around. I think he has more paths to victory in this fight. And I think the aggressive style that Matthews brings to the table could possibly allow Bazookia to counter him effectively, maybe even land some takedowns of his own and really start to wear on the gas tank of Matthews and really just, just wear on him overall. Um, Going into starting this fight, I was actually leaning Matthews, but I'm end up coming out on the other other side, picking Bazookia, thinking he can put together a better game plan and execute it a lot better. Uh, not to mention having more legitimate experience. Uh, I think it all favors Bazookia here, and to get him around that minus one twenty five, minus one thirty line, not a bad spot either to take a shot. So give me Bazookia, and I think he wins this fight on the scorecards. Moving on to the next fight, featherweights going out of here as we have Julio Arce making his return after an extended period, uh, extended time off from the cage. Uh, he comes in at minus 400. He goes up against another fighter who's had an extended layoff and Herbert Burns who comes in at plus 300. Now Julio Arce has not really achieved the potential I expected of him when he first made his way into the UFC. He's a very talented striker. We know his Muay Thai is, uh, you know, high level, uh, throws in combinations, has nasty head kicks as well. Um, but his durability has given him some issues in the past, but against very powerful punches like Yidong Song or uh, physicality like Montel Jackson was able to shut him down with control, landing the bigger, better strikes, and then ultimately winning that fight on the scorecards as well. But Arce, you know, he's still a solid fighter. He's still a very solid talent. You know, he has some slick submissions up his sleeve if that's something that he needs to rely on. But him at his best is when he's able to get into his groove with his striking and really touch his opponents up from distance with his one-twos down the pipes, his head kicks, very high-level stuff that we normally see from him. His opponent this weekend, Herbert Burns, uh, is now oh, sorry, 2-2 two and two in the UFC, but... Uh, yeah, I believe it's 2-2 two two in the UFC, uh, but 0-2 in his last two fights, both fights in which we see his horrible gas tank on display. His last fight against Bill Aljo, he, it says TKO exhaustion, which is hilarious because it looked like he was just completely out of it. His lungs were empty. He just... He just doesn't know how to manage his gas tank. Anytime he's unable to finish his opponents early, you see him start to feel the resistance and start to slow down and then eventually start looking for a way out as well. He's dangerous in the early going. He has some good power, some solid jiu-jitsu, nasty in the clinch. But if he's unable to put his opponents away, things could start to get shaky for him. And... Um, uh, that's when we see better opponents like Daniel Pineda and Bill Algio go out there and put the work on him and eventually finish him in the second round. That's where I think we're going to end up seeing him here. He'll present some early danger. Don't get me wrong, but I think for the most part, we'll see Arce stay safe at distance, land his pot shots down the pipe, uh, really make Burns work with a lot of movement and a lot of output. And then in that second and third round, I think we'll eventually see Arce really start to turn the, uh, the volume up here and that will eventually see him get Burns out of there probably in the second or third round I think RC is worth the chalk in the spot uh, you know it is a little bit concerning considering the power in which Burns throws with early but I think that will see RC quickly get into his groove avoid those shots maybe mix it up in the clinch a little bit really work the body of Burns and then really start to reap the fruits of his labor in the second and third rounds eventually getting that finish so I'm going to go RC RC round th you know what let's say RC round three give him a little time to really get into his groove and then from there get Burns out of there all right, moving on to the strawweight division, we got a bit, uh, high level matchup in my opinion. We got plus 170 coming in on Verna Jandy, Dro Jandy Roba, uh, her opponent this weekend, Lupita Godinez, coming in at minus 200. Uh, starting off on the Jandy Roba side, she's riding a two fight winning streak. Both in fights, she was able to secure takedowns and control her opponents with her high level BJJ black belt. Uh, she was unable to finish those opponents, but still showcased dominance and her ability to get her opponents to the ground and then pretty much keep them there for the entirety of the fight her striking still needs a lot of work her wrestling in my opinion against high levels of competition is going to need a lot of work uh, but her jiu-jitsu when she's able to get fights to the ground very tough to deal with now she was undefeated on the regional scene before coming to the ufc but i think that was a lot to do with the fact that the level of competition she was going against although high level 
for the standard at the time, very much below whatever Jandy Robo was at at that point in time. But you see her coming into the UFC and then dropping fights, you know, to the Mackenzie Derns, uh, the Amanda Hebosses, uh, because she's unable to effectively get ground time. And then she's forced to strike with these women who just have a little more pop on their shots and able to get the better of those uh, exchanges. Lupita Godinez finally getting into her groove, finally entering her prime. She's currently 4-0 over her last four fights, riding that streak uh, and showcasing uh, um, significantly improved striking. You know, coming into the UFC, she was known for her wrestling, her grappling, uh, but her striking has very much improved. And that's where we see her really boxing her opponents up, hurting them, as we saw her do uh, over and over again to Elise Reed. She dropped Tabitha Ricci as well. Uh, Very high level fighter here. And I think the main thing to focus on for this matchup is the wrestling advantage that Godinez is going to have here as she should be able to use it defensively, keep this fight standing where she should eventually start utilizing her striking advantage <coughs> Excuse me. Start putting those punches together and really start to hurt Jandy Roba. I think that this could potentially lead to Godinez's first knockout victory in the UFC if she can successfully get off on her punches enough and not spend too much time up against the cage defending takedowns. Now, I'm not saying it's a lock by any means that Godinez finishes this fight, but it's definitely on the table. And I believe the last I saw was plus 750 on her to win by knockout, worth a little bit of a sprinkle in my opinion. Jandy Roba's hands. No bueno, right? Getting outboxed by Mackenzie Dern, uh, getting outboxed by Amanda Hebos as well. Not the greatest of look, in my opinion. Hebos is obviously not a horrible striker, much better striker than I was originally giving her credit for. But considering the kind of pop and power that we're seeing out of Godinez as she continues to get more comfortable in the striking realm, I think it spells a lot of bad things for Jandy Roba here. So I like Godinez. She'll control the pace of this fight, controls where it takes place, and I think that'll allow her to go out there and eventually get a knockout victory over Verna Jandy Roba. All right, moving over to the featherweights, we got Nate the Train Landwer coming in at plus 185, going up against Jamal Emmers, who comes in at minus 220. Landwer is coming off of a decision loss against high level featherweight Dan Ige, who was able to use a superior uh, boxing style to really hurt Landwer, get up on the numbers, and really showcase to Landwer that, you know, technically better fighters will be able to get the better of him. Landwer is a guy that relies on wars. He put pushes a pace and pressure that are not a lot of our opponents are able to deal with. He normally comes from a wrestling background and we see him try to implement that at times, but if he's unable to get fights to the ground or uh, really break his opponents with his pressure, he really starts to come up short against guys that are able to touch him up a little bit more in the striking room. We saw that with Julian Rosa. We saw that clearly with Dan Ige as well. Uh, this is a guy that's very tough to control on the mat, especially if, if opponents look for a grapple heavy approaches against him as well. Uh, his durability has been a big question mark in the past but he showcased his chin is not that bad over his last several fights um it's just his pace his willingness to engage in a war that makes him such a dangerous opponent and his opponent this weekend jamal emmers coming off of a quick knockout victory over dennis bazookia uh the fight prior to that i thought he got robbed on the scorecards against jack jenkins which means to me he probably should be on a three-fight winning streak now emmers is a guy that has had fight iq issues in the past which has made it tough for me to truly trust him to invest in him going into these matchups he's fast with his hands has a lot of speed agility good striking but i think the best trade in his uh skill set is his wrestling and ability to dominate opponents on the mat but there have been so many fights where he has refused to do that and go out there and goes out there and strikes with opponents that probably have an edge over him in that matchup um you know, the, the one that always sticks out to me is his contender series fight against Julian Rosa, where he was having clear grappling success in the first round, but then decided to strike with the Rosa and ended up paying for it and getting knocked out. Uh, even the Pat Sabatini fight, playing footsies with a high level BJJ black belt like Sabatini, a big no no. But for some reason, that's what Emmers wanted to do, and he ended up paying for it by uh, losing by heel hook. But then the Hussein Askabov fight, you know, going up against a 23 and 0 prospect, he showcases that he is still a very high level fighter by fighting a very smart game plan, using his striking, using his grappling when he needs it as well. Um, very well rounded fighter here. I, I think he wins this fight. The, the question mark that I have, though, is how he's going to deal with the continuous forward pressure of Lanwer. That could play into his game, though, right? Utilize his speed, counter-striking. Whenever Lanwer tries to cross the pocket, use that speed, pop that one-two down the pipe, pivot off, get back out into range, and then try to rinse and repeat, or at least engage in some grappling as well, see if you can catch uh, Lanwer stacking in certain spots. Um, it's just that 
the 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 constant pressure and forward movement of Landwehr that gives me a little bit of questions on fully trusting uh, uh, Jamal Emers in this spot. I'm still going to pick him to win. I think it's going to be tough for him to put Landwehr away. I'm going to take Emers, Emers by decision. I, I'm going to have to see where the line moves throughout this week to see if I'll actually invest anything into him here. But I do think he wins this matchup, and I think he wins it on the scorecards. Are moving over to the welterweight division, we got Chidi Njokawani coming in as a minus 140 favorite as he goes up against Reese McKee, uh, who comes in at plus 120. Now, Kawani is a long middleweight, but finally deciding to drop down to uh, welterweight, which is a big question mark considering he sometimes struggled to make middleweight as well. It's going to be interesting to see how he looks on the scales this weekend and then how that could impact his performance going into the cage. When he is at his best, he's able to really just um, push... Um, sorry push a solid Muay Thai striking style he's nasty with his knees his elbows especially when he's able to get his opponents in close uh, he puts out decent output uh, a lot of speed good amount of power good sting on his shots as well and uh, it's really been his ground game that has been the the reason a lot of opponents have been able to defeat him in the past you know Albert Derive was able to uh, grind him out in the mat in the first round and then used a high level output in the third round to run away with that matchup uh Gregor Rodriguez was able to knock him out Mihal Oleg Shejak kind of just walked him down and and got him out of there but I think Njokwani is still dangerous the big question mark though is coming down a weight class at 35 years old not the greatest look right um if he's able to kind of um maintain pace and still establish his range, he could be successful, especially with the reach advantage and height advantage he, sh- he should have over most welterweights if he continues to stay at this weight class. His opponent this weekend, Reese McKee, is one of the taller and lankier welterweights as well, uh, only giving up a reach, a reach in height and two inches in reach. You know, Njokwani may not be able to st- establish that, that, that range too effectively here. Now, McKee is a guy that I've been high on in the past. I was high on in him in his last fight against Hans Lusa, as I expected him to have a close first round with Lusa, then start to run away with it in the second and third rounds with his output and his volume. But he was very much nullified there as Lusa was able to pretty much muzzle him on the mat with takedowns and then landing big shots that hurt McKee over and over again and that kept McKee pretty much on the defensive for the majority of that fight. McKee is a guy that's largely relied on high output and high volume for him to get his hand raised but I think it's going to get hard for him to do that against guys that are able to put big power on him. And that's what Njokwani could potentially do in this spot. You know, um, I have my reservations on Njokwani, obviously, because of the weight cut and all that. Um, I'll probably make a final decision on uh, weigh-in day, seeing if he makes the weight, seeing how he looks on the scale. But this is a guy that's been around the game for a long time, right? I don't think he'd make the decision to go to 170 pounds if he really didn't believe that he can make this weight. Um I'm going to lean with him here. I think he has a slicker striking, straight shots down the pipe, the, the speed as well. And that I th- that's something I think he could continue to use, uh, continuously use to hurt uh, Reese McKee throughout this matchup. So I'm going to lean with Njokwani here. Um, I, I have originally written down Njokwani by decision. I think he might end up coming through with a knockout here. McKee hasn't been finished in a while, but I think that the straight shots down the pipe from a guy like Njokwani, seeing McKee get hurt in uh, you know multiple matchups, seeing him take so much damage over the course of his career, this could be the guy that could finally break that chin of McKee and put him out cold here. So uh, I'm going to go Njokwani. I'm going to switch my prediction from by decision to knockout. Um, and I'll take a look at what that knockout prop is uh, as I didn't really pay attention to it because... You know, talking myself into it now, I'm probably <laughs> leaning Njokwani by knockout. So I didn't really look at that prop when the prop said drop. So give me Njokwani, Njokwani by knockout. All right, uh, moving over to the next fight. We got featherweights going at it as we got Bill Algio coming in at minus 205, going up against Kyle Nelson, who comes in at plus 175. Now starting off on the Algio side, who's really in a groove now. Four and one over his last five fights could make an argument that he deserved to win that one loss that he took uh, by split decision to Andre Feely, but he's really grooving. He's really cruising now. This is a guy that utilizes a lot of unorthodox movement and footwork to get off on his strikes, likes to utilize that lead leg to really hurt the uh, his opponent's lead foot, whether it's like the 
the side kick to the leg or even just chipping away at their lead leg and then following up with strikes that come from all weird and unorthodox angles that opponents are really not are really not expecting it to come from um he has some solid bjj as well i believe he's a bjj black belt um he normally utilizes that when he's able to hurt his opponents and get them to the mat uh but a lot of lateral movement a lot of um really picking his opponents apart from distance what he was able to do against alexander hernandez last time around sweeping him on the scorecards by just completely outworking him on the feet it was a thing of beauty probably the best performance that we've ever seen from bill algio since being in the ufc his opponent this weekend kyle nelson was a guy that was probably getting caught going into 2023 but luckily for him a fight that went to a draw against duo Troy gave him new life with the promotion and since then he's been able to pull off back-to-back upset victories and go on a two-fight winning streak now Kyle Nelson utilizes a more calculated striking approach than we've seen from him in the past and I think that's largely the reason he's been so successful as of late he has some big power in his hands but that's something that he used to rely on too much in the past which caused him to slow down and get beat up by more well-rounded fighters but he's being a little bit smarter now keeping a high tight guard knowing the times to throw a leg kick knowing the times to crash in with a, a combination of strikes um, he's definitely getting better the experience is definitely helping him out at this stage of his career however I think he's in for a rough time here against Bill Algio, who should be able to dictate the pace of this fight, who should really have success from just staying busy from range and making it hard for uh, Nelson to crash the pocket enough to get off on his own uh, offense. I think that will see Nelson start to chase Algio a little bit too much, uh, too much that will cause Algio to land some effective counters. And I think that will see Nelson start to slow down later on in this matchup, which could potentially open up late finishes for Algio in this spot as well. But I think we'll see Aljo stick to what's gotten him successful recently, and that's mainly just stay uh, in perpetual movement, uh, stay moving laterally, utilize kicks from distance, uh, utilize that straight shot down the pipe when it sees uh, when he sees the opening for it, uh, and I think it just puts together a much better game than we'll see from Kyle Nelson this time around. So um, hurts me as a Canadian to pick against the guy in Kyle Nelson, but I think Bill Aljo gets his hand raised here, and I'm going to I'm going to ultimately say by decision. All right, moving on to the next matchup. Talked about a lot on the timelines. I'm seeing it due to the lines here, but we got a middleway fight between Nursultan Ruzibov, who comes in at minus 250. He goes up against Cedricus Dumas, who comes in at plus 210. Now, Ruzibov made his successful UFC debut last time around as he knocked out Bruno Fajera in the first round. I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that we saw Ruzibov come in with a huge height advantage and a big reach advantage, which made it really hard for Fajera to close that distance and get off on his own success. Ruzibov was able to snipe him down the pipe and eventually... Uh, TKO him in that spot um but this is a guy that's you know he's aggressive has some good chokes has some good uh, uh aggressive striking styles um he's teamed up with the Marquez MMA crew over there in Philly over his last two camps now uh, really getting established on this side of the world rather than to have to you know change uh which continent he's on to get to his fights 30 years old has 42 fights under his belt if I'm not mistaken now um it's insane the amount of experience he has although a lot of that experience is coming against lower level of competition guys have been able to grind him out in the past that's a big question mark for him uh is he going to be able to up the aggressiveness against the types of guys he's going to be fighting in the ufc that's a big question mark as well so i understand why a lot of people are kind of skeptical of the minus 250 on his uh on his uh money line here on the flip side, for Cedric Dumas, he managed to go on a two-fight winning streak now since losing his uh, UFC debut to Josh Fremd. Uh, he's been able to take both Cody Brundage and Abu Azaitar to a decision, grinding out Cody Brundage over 15 minutes, grinding out Azaitar in the first round of their fight, and then outstriking him in the third round to get the decision there. But he's a guy that I have a lot of question marks about still as well. Um, Likes to use, utilize a lot of kicks from distance. Uh, when he has enough of a grappling advantage, he looks to take his opponents to the mat and grind them up from that top spot. But I'm, I'm, I'm just not fully sold on him as of yet. You know, I, I have a lot of question marks about the level of competition he'll be able to defeat. You know, a lot of people are low on Josh Frem, not me. And we saw what Josh Frem was able to do with him. You know, Cody Brundage, 
continuously jumping guillotine, giving up that top position to Dumas, allowed Dumas to ground that fight out. And then the Abu Zaitar fight, a guy coming back from a seriously long layoff uh, and really not being that great of a fighter either, Dumas was able to take advantage of him as well. So this is a very weird matchup. I can understand the, the underdog shot here on Dumas for a lot of people, but I think that we'll still see a little bit more aggressiveness from Ruzi Boev. Uh, you know, having the height advantage here could allow him to really keep Dumas at distance with his kicks. Obviously, Dumas has a uh, three-inch reach advantage here, so that might help with his punches. But I wonder if we'll see Ruzi Boev's aggressiveness be the difference maker in this matchup. As long as he doesn't leave his neck open for Dumas to snatch it up like he did against Matej Penas on the uh, Contender Series, this is a fight that Ruzi Boev could win as well. So I'm going to lean with Ruzi Boev. Dumas, absolutely a live underdog. Uh, but for our prediction's sake, I'm going to go Ruzi Boev inside the distance. Dumas, by decision, may not be a bad prop sprinkle either. All right, moving on to the next fight. We got veteran and former middleweight champion Chris Weidman making his return to the cage, coming in at plus 245. He goes up against Bruno Silva, who comes in at minus 285. Now, Weidman, it's one and four over his last five fights. Now, last time around, I had some confidence that he'd be able to defeat Brad Tavares, as I thought his wrestling would be too much for Tavares. But... Tavares came in with a solid game plan. My knock on Tavares going into that matchup was the fact that he would not be able to muster up enough striking success here to knock Chris Weidman out, which is why I thought Weidman would be in this fight until at least the scorecards, which made me believe that he could possibly have some wrestling success. But Brad Tavares utilized a very calculated calf-kicking approach to really slow down Weidman, uh, beat him up on the feet, but credit to Weidman for not uh, looking for a way out in that matchup. But at 39 years old, his body is withering. He can't take as much damage in the past, even if it's not his chin, just, just his body overall. It's not a good look. We know what to expect from him, wrestling, looking to grind his opponents out, but I just don't know if he can be as successful with it at this stage of his career as he was when he was middleweight champion, or at least en route to being a middleweight champion. I'm glad he's fighting at 185 because that 205 experiment was a horrible idea for himself. Uh, but still, this kind of seems like the spot where he should be hanging it up rather than going in there and fighting a guy with as much knockout power as Bruno Silva normally brings to the table. Now, talking about Bruno Silva, he's also 1-4 over his last five fights, which is what, probably why the UFC decided to match these two guys up. Uh, last time around, we saw Silva get out, pretty much outkicked by Sheriff... Uh, uh, bullet Magomedov, Shara Magomedov. Uh, Magomedov utilized a lot of movement and a lot of kicks from distance that caused Silva a lot of issues, which is why Silva decided to start going to grappling in the second and third rounds, but was unable to get off on enough effective damage as Magomedov was able to win some of those rounds just off of his back by st staying busier, landing elbows, landing punches, and uh, you know, optically making it look like he was the one in an advantageous position, even though he was on his back. We know what Silva is normally about. He usually deals with guys that look to take him to the ground and grind him out, but then he always stays in the fight with the big power that he brings to the table. If Weidman is unable to finish him early on in this matchup with a submission or anything like that, things could get shaky for Weidman real quick if Silva you know, continues the confidence and power that he normally brings to the table. Is that worth minus 285 though on Silva? Probably not. His knockout prop was minus 175, still a little bit too wide for me. But I do think that we see Silva find that knockout in the spot. He might give up a takedown or two, but I don't believe in Weidman's finishing ability in this stage of his career to avoid getting knocked out in the second or third rounds by Silva once he starts to get a beat on the type of entries that Weidman's going to be shooting and then eventually timing either an uppercut or just an explosion to eventually find that chin of the veteran here. So give me Silva, Silva by knockout, but I want none of this minus 285. That line is just way too wide. All right, co-main event time. We got Vicente Luque coming in at minus 115 in this welterweight matchup against Joaquin Buckley, who comes in at minus 105. Now, starting off on the Luque side, he snapped a two-fight losing streak last time around in a main event slot where he went out there and won at least three rounds against two against Rafael Dos Anjos, utilizing more of a grappling game than we've seen from him in the past. I don't know if he just saw that he had more of a strength advantage over uh, Dos Anjos, who normally fights at lightweight, uh, but... We saw him have some solid takedowns, good entries, and control that fight from that top position, while also showcasing his patented striking style that we've known to love and adore. He's very violent. This guy loves to put on entertaining matchups by engaging in wars with his opponents, which has ultimately led to him getting hit a little bit more than I would like. And obviously, we saw Jeff Neal eventually finish him in the third round of their war as well. 
but I think that we'll see um, Luke really start to get back into his own here. He's only 32, right? He still has a couple solid um, years left in his career, especially if the durability issues are a, a thing of the past. His opponent this weekend, Joaquin Buckley is on a two-fight winning streak after snapping a two-fight losing streak that he was on, but he's been able to get, knock out guys like Andre Fialio, and then last time around, uh, land the bigger more impactful shots against Alex Morono who's normally a guy that goes out there and uses a volume heavy pressure heavy sorry pressure heavy style against his opponents but Buckley you know bided his time landed the bigger shots made it more look uh, sorry made it look more uh, optically pleasing to the judges and ultimately he was able to get his hand raised on the scorecards there in this matchup I think both guys are going to bang it out right uh, I think we might even see Luke actually look to get some grappling going and try to nullify Buckley's uh, speed and power advantage by taking him to the mat but I think that the veteran experience of Luke is going to start to come through here do I have question marks about his durability against a power puncher like Buckley? Of course, it's possible that he can land a big shot here, but I think Luke has way more skills. I think he's way more talented than Buckley as well. And as long as he can attack this fight correctly, utilizing the leg kick, you know, we know Luke has a very nasty leg kick. If you can implement that on Buckley here to take off a little bit of the pop and power from Buckley, he can start to really start to come on in the second and third rounds here, putting that pressure on Buckley and putting him into uncomfortable positions. So to get a guy of Luque's level at minus 115, a steal, in my opinion. I think he's definitely worth a shot in this spot. Even if you feel a little bit uh, nauseous about taking Luque against a power puncher like Buckley, maybe a sprinkle on Buckley by knockout as a hedge is not a bad spot. But I really like Luque in the spot to go out there uh, and really put the hurt on Buckley, which could potentially produce a finish for him as well maybe even a submission. So give me the veteran Luque to uh, con uh, get a winning streak going here by finishing Joaquin Buckley within two rounds. Prob probably even the third. All right, flyweight main event up next. Possible number one contendership on the line here. We got Aaron Blanchfield coming in at minus 185. She goes up against Manol Firo, who comes in at plus 160. Now, just quickly looking at the write-up that I have for my Patreon folks, probably one of the longer write-ups that I've had for a matchup in a long time. Uh, just going to quickly look at it here. Um, almost 900 words on this breakdown between the two fighters. So let's start off on the Blanchfield side. Obviously, she's absolutely streaking. I think it was only her fourth professional fight that she has a loss on. Since then, she's won uh, nine straight fights or 10 straight fights. Um, that loss came to Tracy Cortez in somewhat of a close matchup, but that was uh, a fight where Cortez was able to establish her grappling dominance more than anything. Uh, but Bl Blanchfield is a fighter that largely relies on grappling dominance for her to get her hand raised. Um, she's looked pretty damn good through her career so far, especially with that big victory she had over Miranda Maverick, where she landed a ton of takedowns and had a bunch of control time as well. Now, this is an intriguing stat that I posted on Twitter earlier this week uh, when I started researching this matchup. Um, she went, Aaron Blanchfield went 10 of 11 on takedown attempts to her first two UFC matchups. That's against Sarah Alpar and Miranda Maverick. Since that matchup, her next four fights, she's gone 2 of 22 on takedown attempts, 0 of 14 on takedown attempts against Tyler Santos, which was her last matchup. The, the reason she was able to secure top time in that second round against Santos was the fact that Santos tried going for a sacrifice throw of her own, botched it, and Blanchfield ended up on top of her and grinded her out for the rest of that round. Um, but we did see Santos eventually work back to her feet, get back to the cage, and really just defend well enough. Uh, it seemed to me that Santos was starting to slow down where Blanchfield was able to really start picking up the pace. Uh, and that's the best part about San uh, Blanchfield is the fact that, you know, 2 of 22, you can't knock her persistence and determination to go out there and try to secure a takedown. It means that she continuously moves forward. She's staying in her opponent's face. She leaves a lot of openings in the striking realm, which is why we saw her get a little bit bloodied up by Tyler Santos. So that's a little bit of a red flag there. But her her willingness to uh, enter the fire, knowing that she's going to get hit, to eventually clamp onto her opponent, put her through the, put them through the grind up against the cage, or try to drag them to the mat. Um, Cardio is going to be an interesting thing to note going into this matchup. Obviously, it's a 25-minute fight. Does Blanchfield have the cardio to keep that Marab style up? Or is she going to start to slow down later on in this matchup as well if she's unable to secure much dominant control or uh, uh, positions or anything like that? Uh, solid grappler. We know what she can do on the map. We saw what she did against uh, Jessica Andrade and Molly McCann and J.J. Aldrich, although that Aldrich fight 
didn't look like it was really going her way. Aldrich won the first round defending the takedowns and now boxing her, and then eventually fell into some weird uh, guillotine choke that uh, Blanchfield was able to take home with her. Um, so moving over to the Firo side, we know she is a kickboxer, right? She comes from that striking background. You see a little bit of karate in her stance at times. Her only defeat came in her first professional fight, which was over six years ago, I believe now. Uh, and that came at the hands of Bellator title contender Leah McCourt. That was a fight where McCourt was able to continuously get the fight to the ground and out-grapple Mano Firo. But Firo has shown off solid takedown defense uh, throughout her uh, UFC career thus far. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I had some interesting stats that I wrote down for this matchup. So uh, in the 77 minutes of cage time that Mano Firo has been in the UFC, she's only been controlled for a minute and 40 seconds. There's one fighter that was able to control her for 40 seconds. I think that was the most amount of time. But all other opponents failed in terms of keeping her in a bad position. That has to do with the fact with her ability to know what she's doing in the clinch, especially when she gets pushed up against the cage, which is not often. She digs for underhooks. She gets the wizard. And if her opponents try to take her to the ground, she clamps onto that wizard, eventually working her way back to her feet and then framing off her opponent, digging the underhook, pivoting off the cage and then getting back out into distance. She moves laterally a lot. That's why a lot of opponents have issues trying to track her down and get off on much of their own damage. She uh, she moves in a direction that causes her opponents to move towards her power hand as well, which is why she's able to just plant her feet real quick when her opponents aren't expecting it and land that one-two down the pipe to land some significant damage. Um, her takedown defense is improving. Her get-ups have definitely improved. She doesn't settle for bad positions at all, even though we haven't really seen her in many bad positions. Um... And we know she has some decent sting on her shots, which obviously allows it to look optically better for the judges should fights ever go to the scorecards. The The big thing here is going to be if Firo can continue that style over the course of 25 minutes. It's going to be tough to put Blanchfield away. Uh, we know Firo is not a potent finisher. She just likes to sting her opponents more often than not. Doesn't really go for the knockout. So it 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 all depends. Can she go 25 minutes knowing that she's going to spend a little bit of time on the cage fending off the potential takedowns that are coming her way from Blanchfield? But seeing the improvements that I've been seeing from Firo and the possible strength advantage she can have in those spots as well, things could get sticky for Blanchfield. We've seen her get outboxed by J.J. Aldrich. We've seen her get outstruck. We, we know that she has issues with her striking defense and that could play into Firo's favor here, allowing Firo to land shots straight down the pipe. Now, I didn't post that tweet earlier this week in regards to, uh, you know, the ineffectiveness of uh, Blanchfield's takedowns over her last four fights, simply to just pick Firo based off of that. But it's everything that I'm seeing inside the tape as well. I could be wrong here, but I think this fight should be closer to 50-50, um, maybe even minus 120 in favor of Blanchfield, considering the grappling dominance that she has shown in the past. But Firo's improvements and her ability to keep fights upright could make this very difficult for Blanchfield. This kind of reminds me of like a Leon Edwards, Kamaru Usman type thing where Kamaru was continuously failing on takedown attempts and then he was the one eating the damage, which is what Firo could possibly end up doing here. So I, when I ri originally wrote the breakdown for this, I think we saw Firo around plus 130. She's up to plus 160 now. And I feel like we're going to continue to see some Blanchfield movement this week. So I'm going to stay away for now. I might throw a half unit on Firo now just to take advantage of plus 160 in case that line doesn't end up getting better. But if it does continue to get better, I will have at least a solid unit on Firo on the spot. This is We're playing the numbers in this fight. And I've seen enough from Firo and the improvements that, we, that she's been making and enough striking um, flaws in Blanchfield's game to make me believe that the more damaging blows can come from Firo and her continuous perpetual movement and style of moving around the cage is going to cause uh, Blanchfield a lot of problems. And this is another thing. A lot of opponents have had trouble getting in the in on the hips of Firo because she doesn't stay stationary. She's continuously moving. So whenever Blanchfield crashes the pocket with her linear shots down the pipe, and I'll give it to her, she does a good job in terms of throwing punches and then engaging in the clinch or dropping for a takedown after that. But the continuous movement of Firo allows her to pivot off of any attempt that Blanchard will be trying to go for when she's trying to just, you know, bull rush Firo in certain spots. So I got to go with Firo here. Odds wise, I think plus 160 is a damn good number to take a shot on as well. Um, I think we're going to see late 
action, late week movement on Blanchfield to potentially get a better line on Firo. But I do like Firo to win this matchup. Uh, the last few, last two rounds are going to be sticky. Last three rounds might be sticky. But I think that she'll have done enough damage in the first three rounds at least to get her hand raised on the scorecards here. So give me Firo and Firo by decision. Scorch me all you want in the comment section. I've done the tape. I've done the studying. This is what I see. If this was a pick -em, maybe you could make a case for... Well, you could make a case for Blanchfield. Obviously, Grappler is usually more dominant, but seeing the improvements that Firo has made throughout her career, uh, staying off the cage, staying out of clinch situations, staying out of uh, grappling situations, I think it's going to be hard for Blanchfield to secure uh, significant enough top time to either finish Firo or to win rounds decisively compared to the damage that Firo is going to be dishing out in, uh, in exchange of that. So give me Firo and Firo by decision, and she should be the next number one contender. There you guys go. Breakdowns on all 14 fights. I feel like I went long on some of these breakdowns. So I appreciate you guys staying with your boy throughout this uh, breakdown. Um, you know, on a two-event two winning streak now with the UFC up solid over there. Hope to keep that going in, going into this weekend. We also have some regional cards going down this weekend. Uh, let me just quickly pull that up. I will also be breaking down ACA 173, LFA 180, and Cage Warriors 169, all on the Patreon page. Check the link in the description below for the lock of the night Patreon page, not the MMA Fight Archive. And you guys will be able to get those breakdowns there. Not to mention just those breakdowns, but DGen parlays, early access to the Lockheed Trinity slash Lockheed Two Step parlay, uh, same game parlays, all that good stuff. I cover every single UFC card with a fine tooth comb, and you guys can find all that information on the Lock of the Night Patreon page. Link for that in the description below. All right. That is enough for me. Um, I want to get this podcast out for you guys ASAP. It's already Monday evening. Uh, and I'll see you guys tomorrow for the top three lock of the night plays or lock of the night candidates for UFC Atlantic City. See you guys then. Peace.